and it's usually uh, not done by GI doctors. Usually, if you wanted to have a GI doctor come in, you can have them do the gastric part of the portion of the procedure for esophagectomies. But for the most part, esophagus falls under a thoracic surgeon's um, a discipline. So just to give you, I have no disclosures per se. So as the topic has suggested, I'm going to try to focus on some surgical management of benign pathology. I focused it on esophageal strictures and spontaneous perforations. And then obviously during that whole time, I will talk about how we are now making men's to salvage the esophagus. And back in the day, we used to do esophagectomy more easily, but nowadays we are not doing that. Uh, and then the challenges that we have when we are trying to salvage the esophagus. And then I'll end up uh, with this GERD topic. Hopefully I can get into some of the GERD uh, discussion, but um, just because GERD itself can be a whole topic of itself, and outcomes and et cetera, et cetera. So maybe we'll revisit that another day to go over the literature. So what is an esophageal stricture? And I understand that there are people from all the way from residency to a, um, an attending ship or working as a full-fledged physician. So I'm, I'm gonna cover everything and hopefully if not insulting anyone. But what we typically find with esophageal stricture, most patients will present with uh, dysphagia, having food stuck in, and food impaction, getting it dislodged. And when you look, do ever get an esophagram, a study on them, you'll find out that there's a narrowing. Um, and, you know, while that can be Skatsky's ring, a Skatsky's ring is not in a complete obstructive pathology. Usually the food can get stuck there, but then it passes on. And if you were to scope these patients, you'll find this ring um, where it looks like scar tissue that's formed. I'm not sure how to get rid of this arrow that's coming on my slide. Uh, I'll just tell you, uh, if you click on view options at the top and you annotate, you, you need to take away your annotations. If it's coming from your movements, and then okay, we've got it clear. That's good. Carry on. All right. So typically, how you know most first things first, we try to dilate it. That's usually what a GI doctor would do, a thoracic surgeon would do, and there are different types of dilators. There are these shock dilators. Where there are these blunt dilators. Now, as you would imagine, a blunt dilator against a stricture won't work because you've got an obstruction and it's going to hit it, and you definitely don't want, don't want to perforate it. In those cases, this a tapered dilator is definitely better. These tapered dilators come in different shapes and sizes. They range from anywhere from 20 French to 60 French. So, if you were going to do the math, you can divide this by 3.14, meaning pi and try to figure out what's this diameter. This would be about a six millimeter diameter. That's about a 20 millimeter diameter. Um, and you try to dilate. And what typically you would do, you can either dilate it blindly by going through the uh, stricture and passing your dilator so that it's tapered and it gradually advances. Or you could do this other technique, which I prefer. It's a little bit better and guided. You pass a wire through an endoscope leave the wire in place. You can always uh, couple that with uh, fluoroscopy in the operating room. So that way you have a, a fluoroscopy making sure that you are in the center of the lumen, you're not gonna perforate someone. And then you take these dilators, these savory dilators, which has a hollow lumen in there. And you can pass these dilators over a wire knowing that you're safely dilating. And typically they, these di uh, they come in different sizes and you can upsize it. Usually we recommend only going three dilations up at a time, not more than that. And anytime you dilate, if you get blood back on your dilators, then obviously you should stop because you're tearing the mucosa and you can lead to a full-fledged perforation. You don't want a full thickness perforation. The patient will have a hard time. Now you'll have, you may have two strictures to deal with or a stricture that would happen just from the inflammation from the tear. There is another modality that people can use. I like uh, using this as well. This is a CRE balloon. These come in, um, you can dilate an airway stricture, which is a bronchoscopic CRE balloon, but the esophageal dilation, dilators tend to be a little bit broader length of the tube itself. They come in different diameters. You can see this is an esophageal, what's called esophageal pyloric colonic, and the purple bag is usually the esophageal dilators itself. There's not a whole lot of difference except that this is about five and a half centimeter, the balloon, and on the esophageal, they're eight centimeters. So you can dilate a longer segment of the esophagus. 
And the measurement, the diameters are listed on top. They come in uh, different six, eight, nine, ten millimeters, or six, seven, eight. They can start from that range up to the 20 millimeters. And the way these work is that you actually put them endoscopically through the uh, endoscope and pass it, and then you can have a, a, a gun that's hooked onto the other end. So this is typically how it's attached. There's a gun which has some radio opaque uh, contrast that you inject with a pressure monitor, and the pressure monitor will tell you how far up are you going on your pr atmospheric pressure as the balloon is being dilated across the stricture. And as you dilate it, is there's usually every CRE balloon has a, st a sticker that comes with it, uh, that tells you, you know, if you're at three atmospheric pressure, that's going to be a 10 millimeter balloon. If you're at five atmospheric pressure, you'll be at 11 millimeter balloon. If you're eight atmospheric pressure, then you're at a 12 millimeter balloon. And the way it works is that when you first start dilating, you typically see this waste and the stricture. And if your dilations are working, usually you hold them 30 seconds to a minimum of one minute um, um, time so that you allow this dilation to happen. After the dilation, you should almost see the, the waste go away. Another modality that uh, we like using is esophageal stent. So after you've dilated, you can leave an esophageal stent, especially in a patient who you keep bringing back to the hospital or to the GI lab to keep doing recurrent dilations. You can bridge them by placing a stent and seeing if the stent would allow it to expand um, these come in different shapes and forms. This is a completely uncovered stent. These are fully covered stents, and then there are partially covered stents where the flared ends are not covered, which I like because uh, sometimes you like these stents. They have a high risk of migration, and you don't want them to migrate. Uh, so what you can do is you can deploy these stents, and when they're uncovered at the partial end, that end will ingrain into the esophagus wall and um, will form some granulation tissue and anchor it so that the stent doesn't migrate. If you use a fully uncovered stent, you can imagine the entire esophageal length can actually ingrain and form so much granulation tissue that when you try removing it after two or three or four weeks, uh, every, every, you know, it's operator dependent when you try to remove it to see if the stricture is improving, this whole thing can be ingrained. And when you remove it, the granulation tissue can tear and cause some trauma and a significant amount of bleeding. So I preferably don't like using a fully uncovered stents, although some surgeons do. I like in strictures, and I like doing this partially uncovered stent. You can also couple both of the modalities. This is an image that I have for a patient who had a balloon dilation followed by a stent uh, published in a different study where they took a, a patient, this is a stricture that they saw, they used a CRE balloon, dilated it, and then placed a stent. You could have also done that with a savory dilator and then the next stent. You can then do the most morbid procedure, which is an esophagectomy. If all else fails and you've got a recalcitrant stricture, first of all, you should know why you have a stricture, right? I mean, you should do a workup and see if it's a stricture related to GERD because if it's a GERD stricture, then you should manage them with PPIs or an anti-reflux procedures, such as a Nissen or a Toupe, and I'll get into that in a few minutes. Um, and it, it can be as simple as CMV esophagitis. Say a patient is immunosuppressed, has HIV, has some sort of cancers on chemotherapy, and has developed CMV. So if you biopsy the stricture and you sent a viral pathology on it, and you found out it's got, he's got CMV, maybe they needed to be treated with an antiviral drug so your stricture can heal while you're trying to dilate it and help them not undergo any major procedure. Now, if all else fails, then you can do an esophagectomy. Um, I don't know how many of you guys do esophagectomy, but for board answers, uh, you probably at least need to know when to defer a patient for an esophagectomy. This is a picture that I got for where it says cancer and nearby tissue removal, but as you can imagine, it's the similar pathology for stricture. You will take away a good 60% to 80% of the esophagus, and then you'll make a tube out of the stomach, so you pull that gastric conduit up, uh, about four to five centimeter diameter. Uh, back in the day, we used to use the full size of the stomach, but we realized sometimes that becomes redundant and can cause issues with gastric outlet obstruction. So we typically try to make a conduit and then pull that into the chest through the posterior mediastinum and then make an anastomosis either to in the chest with an Ivor Lewis or we do that anastomosis somewhere in the neck, which is a McEwen procedure. 
Now, the other things that we deal in the uh, context of benign pathology is esophageal perforation. I actually enjoy taking care of patients with esophageal perforation. Maybe I shouldn't say that. Uh, but because these patients are usually pretty sick when they come in, but if you manage them appropriately and do it right, the right thing, they recover very well. Um, so a patient can come in, usually a typical complaint is chest pain, shortness of breath, because they've perforated and they have uh, symptoms of tachycardia, they may be febrile if they've mounted a response yet, uh, and, and will have an elevated white count and abnormal electrolytes sometimes. So if you do an esophagram on these patients, you'll see that the contrast exacerbates from the esophagus and actually winds up behind the heart. Now you can't 100% tell that's within the left pleural space or just in the posterior mediastinum. So sometimes you, have, you can complement that with a, a CT scan to see where that is. But you, for the most part, it doesn't change your management. You still have to go into the left chest, open that mediastinal space, drain the chest itself, as well as the mediastinal space. Otherwise that patient will have Rippering mediastinitis. So if you do a CT scan uh, on the same patient, you can see the contrast exacerbated to the left. Here's the aorta. The contrast just pulls there and stays there. And it kind of has formed a bag of air next to the esoph esophagus itself. So just suggesting that that's not a parietal pleural perforation into the left chest, but it's still contained within the mediastinum. Now, you can try to manage this endoscopically. However, one would ex imagine that this will only become an abscess in the future. If you go in endoscopically and try to debride and wash that space out and place a stent, yeah, you can cover the hole, but this uh, air pocket may have a potential to become an abscess in the future. So uh, you do the esophagram, you see that there's a site of perforation, you take them to the operating room and, and do an endoscopy, and this is what they typically can look like. They can look as simple as this or as bad as that. So if this is a small perforation, that's norm normal esophageal lumen, that's the site of perforation where you see some debris, fibrinous debris and pus accumulating. And if the perforation has gone on for quite a while, you can have a very lengthy perforation. This is a long linear tear in the esophageal wall. And that's a perforation. And you could sometimes take your camera and drive through that space and go straight into the patient's chest and actually be looking at the lung. So sometimes if the perforation is small, especially if you're doing an endoscopic procedure and you find a perforation, you can manage them with a nice, clean, healthy esophagus and you can paste some clips to oppose the esophageal wall and that can work. Sometimes it can be a little bit more aggressive that you can tell that you won't be able to place your clips there, so a stent is appropriate. And, um, you know, I actually did this study in the last uh, couple years ago where we looked at a, patient, um, a bunch of patients. We used to, at my prior institution in Houston where I was, we used to do um, a lot of esophageal stents, and we were pretty much a mecca of all the esophageal perforations that used to come because in Houston, all the cancer patients used to go to um, MD Anderson Cancer Center and we were the next door hospital uh, at Houston Methodist Hospital and majority of the perforations that were not cancer related used to come to the hosp Methodist Hospital where I was. So as you can see in a five year period we did 148 self-expanding metal stent and 121 of them were partially covered and then a few that were, uh, were completely um, covered um, self-expanding metal stents in 83 patients. So major, some of the patients ended up requiring a few stents. And just to go into more details, the indications looking at the bottom of this slide were um, uh, a number of reasons. So some patients had iatrogenic perforations, other had spontaneous perforations. We managed a lot of our patients after an esophagectomy with an esophageal leak uh, with uh, stents so we didn't have to take the conduit down. Uh, a few patients with obstruction and one patient with an esophageal caustic injury after a lie injury. And here were the um, characteristics of our patient population. So a uh, majority of the patients required only one stent and they were able to recover. A few patients required a few, couple stents, three stents. Some of them, seven of them also required four or more stents. The duration of the stent for the most part lasted three weeks or so. Uh, but if you obviously required more than four stents, usually those stents were exchanged every two to three weeks and stayed in longer. The most common complication that we encountered was a migration and one stent caused a perforation which was managed by another stent. Um, 
we used to fix the migrated uh, you, you know, we used to fix most all almost all of our stents you can fix them either with an uh, tts clip through the endoscope clip to keep it anchored usually they don't work because the esophageal mucosa sloughs off and this clip falls off and the stent will, can still migrate uh, there are uh, other ways to stent by doing an Apollo endo stitch. There's an endo stitch that you can place and you can put some stitches around your stent and anchor it so that it doesn't migrate. When you remove the stent, you have to use an endoscopic scissors to cut that stitch to, before pulling the stent. And then the last thing that I like doing is an umbilical tape. You take two long length umbilical tapes and put it on the distal end of the esophageal stent before deploying it. And as you deploy the stents, those two umbilical tapes stay within the patient's, uh, the, the, the two tails of the umbilical tape stay within the patient's esophagus, abutted against the esophageal mucosa, and then they come out through the patient's mouth. And what I do is I go in through each nair and grab the end of the, uh, end, uh, the umbilical tape from each nair from one to the other, and then pull both of them out, then tie it to each other over a piece of gauze. And that's called uh, bridling an umbilical tape. Usually you keep that in place for four days. Um, after four days, the granulation tissue has formed enough for the esophagus to anchor, for the stent to anchor to the esophagus. And then you can snip the knot at the end of your nair um, and the patient can swallow those strings. And usually those strings will just dangle down and hang into the stent. And then when you remove the stent, the both the umbilical tapes can come out. I have another paper, a technique paper somewhere uh, on that. So if anyone's interested, they can look it up. Now you would think that I would, I'll find that all the stents that migrated were fully covered, but was, that was not the case. In fact, two of the partially covered stents still migrated. Whether that's because after anchoring, um, the stents still didn't have enough granulation tissue that could be a possibility or the patients that were not fixed migrated, but actually that was not the case. Both the stents that were partially covered that migrated were fixed. Um, there are several complications uh, after placing a stent. You can see from this um, graph that there were patients who had migrations after leak. Um, some patients, one patient who had perforated. Other patients required other drainage procedures. So if you've had uh, esophageal perforation, yet you have an empyema as well. You, you usually need to go to the operating room for that sort of, sport, sort of perforation and uh, to wash out the chest as well. And there were a few patients that we were not able to salvage the esophagus despite all heroic efforts. So in the end, what we concluded that we had an 82% salvage rate of our native esophagus or a conduit, which is not bad if you're able to save 82% from undergoing a major morbid procedure of an esophagectomy or a conduit takedown. This is another novel uh, approach that uh, Germans came out with. So Dr. Rolf Weidenhagen is a colorectal um, surgeon in uh, Germany. And in 2001, he had designed this endovac therapy where you take away, you much like a wound back therapy in patients, you know, chest wall wounds or abdominal wounds where we go in and place some vacuum sponges in a cavity which is connected to a wound vac suctioning device. This works the same way, except that you have tubes hanging out either through the colon or the esophagus through the patient's nose. Um, so Dr. Weidenhamer is a GI doc who actually took this approach and uh, stretched to the esophagus to the other end. And it's actually pretty simple the, how to put it together, although I find the procedure quite tedious. So it usually employs an NG tube. There's a black sponge, a scissor, a needle, and a vacuum tubing. And the way it works is you take the sponge and you cut it to the appropriate design shape. You take the NG tube and you actually sew it in place a couple places inside the sponge so that the sponge remains. Then you take your EGD scope and pass the biopsy forcep and grab the end string of it so that you can drive it to the side of the perforation and you take it inside under endoscopic visualization, you go in, find the side of perforation, place your sponge and then you see it. And then you exchange this every two to three days. That's the most tedious part. You have to bring the patient back much like any wound back to exchange it out. And then you'll see that it completely heals it. Uh, obviously not 100% effective. Like everything, everything has risks and complications. 
And so this is the sponge left in, and you can see the wound back, the ch ND tube suction come on, coming out through the sponge. But eventually, you know, they demonstrate that it completely healed the perforation site. There are several studies in the literature. Most of them come from Europe. Um, they, uh, this is a study that came out in 2017. 52 patients that were treated with endovac therapy over a four-year period. Majority of them had an anastomotic leak from a surgery. Then there were esophageal perforations and spontaneous perforations. The, this documented in 52 patients, this documented of 390 interventions. So patients had an, uh, anywhere from one to 25 changes of endovac every three to five days. Can you imagine? They documented a patient had a mean average patient required six changes. Uh, mean duration of therapy was about three weeks. They documented a 94% of complete salvage of their esophagus or the conduit. Three percent, uh, three people did fail. Uh, two bleed, two patients had bleeding and resulted in death because the wound back may have suctioned on the uh, aorta and caused an aorta esophageal injury. And then four patients, as a result of any perforation and an astomotic uh, leak, you can heal and then lead to strictures. Uh, another study came back out. This was actually an um, abstract published in SAGES um, in 2017, but no study ever came out of this that I've been able to locate. So this was a, a single institution study, again, from Europe, uh, largest of its size for endovac, 77 patients over a seven-year period, 59 patients that were included for leak, and then a few, uh, 18 patients with uh, esophageal injury. And they documented about 78% of a restoration of the native esophagus or conduit with an average duration of 11 days. Their median was uh, less than the prior study's mean of 2.75. Uh, and then they documented that some of their patients required a simultaneous stent, about 28% patients, in addition to the endovac. Now, what if you have a perforation that's this bad that you don't think you can help it heal with your uh, stents or your endovac therapy, then your option is actually trying to do a surgical repair. And as uh, nice as pictures, as the pictures that you'll see in books, usually this is not how nice and pretty they look in the operating room. Um, so for board questions, if we get asked, uh, you know, what, how would you manage an esophageal perforation? Say they try to um, tell you that there is no other modality in the hospital, you can't place a stent, you can't place an endovac sponge. Uh, your answer should be that, well, I'll take the patient to the operating room. Now, usually you go to the side of the chest that has perforated, whether it's the left chest, if you have a fluid, uh, air fluid pocket there or right. If you don't have a site that you have left or right, it's better to go on the left only because the esophagus is easier to identify and you can you know, have the heart come anteriorly. So you go through the seventh intercostal space as low as you can go, uh, a posterolateral thoracotomy. For the most part, try to salvage an intercostal muscle flap while you're going in, because if you find a site of perforation, you may want to uh, cover that up with an intercostal muscle flap. You identify the size of the the site of the injury. If you can't find it because there's so much uh, debris, and um, you know, I've I've operated on a patient who had corn sitting in the chest, so I couldn't see anything. Uh, there was so much corn and so much debris and so much green uh, bile that it was difficult to identify planes. So I scoped the patient simultaneously to see where I would see the light come through or the bubbles come through or something to identify it. And then the board answer is that you uh, debride all necrotic tissue, find healthy esophageal mucosa, and you have to lend in your myotomy in order to find healthy end of the esophagus because it's important that you start off with the healthy side of the mucosa to start doing your mucosal repair. You make sure that you take a full a good bite of the mucosa to do your repair, and we would always advocate doing a two-layer repair of your esophageal perforation site. And then you cover it with something. Here, they've shown an intercostal muscle flap come over. Uh, this is easier said than done. Usually, there's so much gross contamination and spillage that it's hard to take a piece of the parietal pleura or the pericardial fat pad to try to cover it. But you should try to cover that with something. Then you lay a drain against your perforation site where you're trying to make it heal and also couple that with one or two chest tubes to drain the pleural space so you don't get, set the patient up with an empyema. Thoroughly irrigate the chest as well to make sure that if there's any debris, you've cleaned that all out. 
the last things, you know, if you are surprised and you are, you find out that the patient has esophageal cancer or it's a perforation site that's beyond repair, your next step should be to consider doing an esophageal diversion. And what you do is you divide the esophagus above the site of perforation. You divide the esophagus below the site of perforation. If you have to pull the stomach up by pulling, putting traction on the esophagus, then pull it up and, um, and divide the esophagus or the stomach at a healthy tissue with a staple line, because you want to make sure that staple line will not to hiss. And then you dump that stomach back into the diaphragm. Here's the important part. Make sure you close that diaphragmatic defect. If you don't, then you're setting that patient up for a diaphragmatic hernia in the future. So you cut that and then you take out the disease segment. And then if you've divided it here uh, above the esophageal perforation site, then you can pull that through the neck to mature your ostomy. Try to go as, length, as low down only because you, if you have enough length of the esophagus, you can work on it on the uh, neck. So you'll be surprised how quickly that esophagus shortens when you pull it out in the neck. Because the, the esophagus is an or, or organ that has a lot of flexibility to come the full length. Uh, oftentimes, you'll probably see, have seen, you do an esophagectomy and you do this whole, you know, six, eight hour operation only to find out your esophagus is like eight centimeters long in your hand, which is usually not the case otherwise. So you've divided this esophagus somewhere distally and you pull it up. And once you pull it up in the neck, it's nice to actually tunnel this esophagus through the it's a subcutaneous tissue and mature the ostomy somewhere on the chest wall on the pecs, only because uh, it's easier to pay for patients to put a plastic bag on and uh, let them drain here. And then you can, uh, whenever you're ready to do your uh, reconstruction, you can divide the esophagus here, cut the, uh, you know, the, the edges of the esophagus and pull it out and do your anastomosis in the neck again. The reason um, why we don't encourage people to do the reconstruction at the time of the index operation is because the patient is usually pretty sick. They're septic. If they, you don't have time to operate on their belly and take out a piece of their colon or small bowel and try to pull it up in the chest, first of all, you would not want to bring your conduit through a contaminated space. So for the most part, you don't want to put your conduit in the posterior media stinum where you've already perforated and you would try to try to bring it uh, anteriorly in, in a retrosternal fashion, but that's not the time to do it. So you, you let the person recover. Uh, if they have cancer and Lord forbid they perforated their cancer while they were being dilated for, per se, or food impaction or something, you've just made them stage four because of the perforation. So you want to get a PET scan, stage them, let, the go, let, let them undergo chemo radiation. And once they've recovered from everything and actually declared that they have no evidence of any more recurrent disease, you can then counsel them about undergoing a reconstruction with either a jejunal conduit or a colon conduit. Um, before switching gears to parasophageal hernia, any questions that the audience have? Should I keep going? Uh, keep, keep going, Pooja. We'll do all the question answers at the end. Okay. So the other topic that I was going to discuss was parasophageal hernia. Um, so I'm sure most of you guys are very aware of the, what a parasophageal hernia is, but just to give you a brief outline. So they come in four flavors. The type one is usually a sliding hernia. Uh, they are very simple. There's a hernia that's the top of the gastric fundus comes in and out. You don't have to operate on every sliding hernia. Only the symptomatic patients should get it because most type one sliding hernias patients can live and die with uh, if they can be managed with just PPIs. Type 2 parasophageal hernias is actually a classic parasophageal hernia. And these are true emergencies. So this is, this is where a gastric fundus has come up through the defect and is sitting up in the chest. And the reason why it's an emergency is because this portion of the gastric fundus can actually become ischemic because of the mere pressure from the diaphragm and actually perforate. I have a patient like that who's sitting in a hospital uh, recovering from her gastric, almost what looks like a wedge gastroplasty because I had to take this portion of the stomach out uh, and then uh, do the wrap for the, from the rest of the fundus that she had and taxi the stomach. A type 3 parasophageal hernia is where your GE junction truly sits above the diaphragm and your stomach hernia is through the chest. And so these are usually fixed. Most patients will have 
uh, can have a very large parasophageal hernia. And for the most part, you don't have to operate on every large parasophageal hernia, but if you were to sit down and talk to the patient, almost always they'll have some symptoms of um, either regurgitation, reflux, dysphagia, even odynophagia, or some symptoms where they'll say, you know what, doc, you are right. I have some symptoms where I don't feel like I'm normally swallowing, like I used to say 20 years ago. And then if you elicit a, a symptom, then you can counsel them that they should undergo a repair. Um, but obviously based on their comorbidities and whether or not they can undergo a general anesthesia. A type four hernia is usually you cannot salvage a patient without an operation. And that's usually when visceral organs are present, uh, where you can have small bowel and colon, as well as a large portion of your stomach sitting on, up in the chest. Typical workup of hernia, I'm sure I don't have to preach to the choir, but you know, first things first, we almost always find out a patient has a hernia based on a, of an esophagram. We tell them to undergo an endoscopy only because you want to find out if they have underlying pathology such as bears, reflux-induced stricture that needs to be evaluated, uh, or even an esophageal mass could be cancer. If you have an EGD, which suggests that the patient has reflux esophagitis, um, and then you've documented that whatever biopsy shows reflux esophagitis, you don't have to undergo this third study, which is the Bravo study. A Bravo study is where you keep take a pH probe and you set it about four to five centimeters above the GE junction. Typically, the patient should be off their PPIs for at least two weeks prior to the Bravo study. And the patient has to wear this monitor at home and keep a diary, uh, a log where they, it it's kind of documents over the next 48 hours, how often do you get symptoms of reflux? And there's a huge algorithm that goes into play uh, and based on six parameters, which are typically, I don't remember every single one of them, but they're based on how often does your pH fall below four on this Bravo probe. So if you're having enough episodes of reflux, you know, you, it, it de depends on, is it every time you're recumbent? Uh, how, you know, is it how often are your episodes? How, long, how many do you have in a, in a day? How long do they last? Um, and if they correlate, especially with your logbook, then you have a high correlation that you do have reflux esophagitis or reflux, and that's documented. Okay, now you can undergo an anti-reflux procedure. A manometry is basically, a, a nowadays high resolution manometry is done by in a GI lab where a patient has a probe that's put in through their, one of their nares and um, they have pressure barometers and manometry markings, either one centimeters or two centimeters apart based on the probe you're using. And the patient is asked to have 10 swallows of a liquid. And as they're swallowing, it gauges their pressure and the manometric pressures in the esophagus to document how, what is your esophagus peristalsis like. If you've got reflux esophagitis for a very long period of time, your esophagus actually burns out. And so you have a an, um, non-functioning or poorly functioning esophagus. And if you were to do a Nissen, which is a 360 degree wrap on that patient, they will not do well because the esophagus, first of all, doesn't have normal peristalsis. And then if you've made a Nissen at the end of their esophagus and caused complete construction obstruction, and they will not be able to pass their bolus foods. So you did the wrong operation on that patient. That patient would have benefited from a toupee which is a partial fundoplication, a 270 degree wrap. Now, we all have um, different cutoffs. I say if a patient can swallow eight out of 10 swallows that are normal, then fine, I'll do a Nissen. If the patient is 80 year old and uh, even has an 80% normal manometry, I'll say, you know, this patient is 80, she doesn't have a long life to live. Um, why should I cause any obstructive symptoms? So I will do what, what I'll say is a loose Nissen or somewhat like a toupee so that I don't cause obstructive symptoms. So this is very operative dependent and unfortunately nobody will be able to do a good randomized trial because most surgeons won't participate in one. And then last thing last, if you have a patient with a hernia who says that they've got obstructive symptoms uh, and especially if they've had long-standing diabetes, always, always complement their workup with a gastric emptying study. You don't want to find out two months after your operation, that they're still having obstructive symptoms, they're still feeling bloated, and they have a lot of pain after your repair, and you, you want, don't want to second guess yourself, is it that I did my 
repair wrong, has a patient have recurrent hernia, it could be that their stomach doesn't empty well. So they've burnt out uh, their vagus nerves and what you probably should have done was uh, either a partial wrap, so they have some way of a pop-off valve, or even considered them to undergo a pyloroplasty or some sort of a pyloric drainage procedure, whether that's a Botox injection of the pylorus or a, a pyloroplasty or pylorobiotomy, whichever case you like. Um, because you don't want to find out that they're having trouble after the operation. The other thing is it also helps you from a malpractice standpoint that if you have a gastric emptying study that shows that their vagus nerves weren't functioning from the get-go, uh, they cannot fault you for bagging their vagus nerves because I'll get into the main points of what you should do when you're doing a hernia repair. So why do these occur? Usually what we think is that there's a progressive weakening and stretching of the phrenoesophageal membrane and that leads to the subsequent enlargement of the hiatus. So your cruise kind of dilates and it becomes separated, thus allowing your stomach to come up into the chest and get exposed to negative pressure of the mediastinum. And because of that, the hernia just keeps getting larger and larger. And because of the negative pressure, you get this reflux of contents up above. And typically what you will see, if this is an, a chest X-ray, where you can see that there's an air fluid level above the diaphragm, suggesting that there's a stomach sitting above, on an esophagram, you'll see a stomach herniating through. This is the GE junction, and that's the stomach that's come up. Uh, the, on the CT scan, you can see this thickening of the gastric wall, and some of the uh, contrast is sitting in, in the chest where it doesn't belong. And on uh, this, this is actually uh, a very nice view, an, an endoscopic view, where you take a retroflex view, and you actually look. This is a normal gastric fundus, but this is the diaphragm here, the rim. And what's sitting above the diaphragm is actually the st uh, stomach and the hernia sac, or not the hernia sac, the hernia itself. Uh, so the main, there are several guidelines that we follow, at least in America, we follow the SAGES guideline and we suggest that you, know, you should manage a patient with GERD according to the GERD guidelines if you have a high hernia, depending on whether or not you're, some, almost every symptomatic patient should undergo an operation Asymptomatic patients can be just watched and you don't have to repair uh, every uh, asymptomatic hiatal hernia. Uh, just to highlight some of the points that I made, repair for type one sliding hernia in the absence of reflux disease is not necessary. There's strong evidence for that. All symptomatic parasophageal hiatal hernia should however be repaired. Strong evidence for that. And especially those who have acute obstructive symptoms or have undergone volvulus. Patients who have acute volvulus where the stomach is twisted, either organoaxial or um, blanking on the other one. Anyways, if they have acute volvulus, they require reduction of the stomach with limited uh, resection if you can. And uh, routine elective of uh, completely asymptomatic pyrosophagy hernias is always, uh, is, may not always be indica indicated. Some of the technical considerations for any type of hernia repair that you should think is hernia shacks should be always dissected away from the mediastinal structures. And if you can excise it, excise it sometimes in a piecemeal fashion. It's important to uh, delineate the right and the left crews and do crew approximation. Uh, important to salvage the peritoneum overlying the crews. You don't want to denude the uh, crews only because stitches to the crews that have been denuded are much difficult to put together. If you leave some of the peritoneum over the crews, the stitches tend to take um, a much, they have much more strength. You can use mesh to reinforce the hernia repair as, uh, at the diaphragm site. Uh, not recommended. There are surgeons who hate it. There are surgeons who love it. Uh, I say if you can bring it together and you don't feel any tension, it's reasonable to not use a mesh. But if you use a mesh, try using an uh, absorbable mesh so that it can blend in with your diaphragmatic defect that you've repaired. Then it's important to return your GE junction back to an infradiaphragmatic position. And we actually recommend that esophagus should be uh, at least, the GE junction should be at least two to three centimeters below the diaphragm. Uh, and if in case you don't have enough, you may have to do a gastroplasty which is a wedge resection of the stomach of the gastric fundus so that you can lengthen the esophagus. Usually when you do that, you should always place a bougie in the esophagus so that you don't narrow the esophageal lumen. 
uh, and you cut, come kind of parallel to the esophagus as much as possible. Much harder to do it laparoscopically through the abdomen. Back in the day, we all used to make a incision through the left chest and try to bring the stapler in through the left chest to the diaphragm to do this gastroplasty. But nowadays, we just try to manipulate the esophagus and the stomach enough to rotate it to do the gastroplasty. Um, and then uh, you take out that wedge and pass it, pass it off your operating table. If you have to, if a patient has a huge high, high hernia and a parasophageal hernia, uh, especially if they're old, you don't have to do a fundoplication. If they're 90 years old and you just want to get them off the table, you can pexy that stomach. Bring it down, pexy it to the abdominal wall. You can even place a pen tube or feeding tube in the stomach to use it as an anchoring mechanism. Um, and then let, let the, uh, rip, you know, the defect um, um, B, you don't do the fundoplication and you just uh, uh, reapproximate the crora, the left and the right crora, to make sure that nothing else herniates through that defect anymore. Um, and then, I, like I said, the hernia reduction with just gastroplexy alone and no hyal hernia is a safe alternative, especially for high risk patients. Uh, but it can be associated with high recurrence rate. So we won't recommend that on a 40 year old patient. But if it's a 90 year old patient, you just want to get off the table who's got multiple comorbidities, that's um, advisable. So many different approaches. Um, like I said, you can either do a transabdominal, there's a transthoracic approach that I was going to highlight because in more, more and more in the US at least, we don't do a transthoracic approach unless we need to. But it's important for us to understand, especially for general surgeons, uh, that there is a thoracic approach that is in the armamentorium of operating on these patients. Uh, so laparoscopically or robotically, you use multiple ports in the abdomen, and you can either repair the crora by uh, reapproximating it primarily with interrupted stitches, or you can use different size pledgets, reinforce it with a mesh, either even posteriorly or anteriorly or both, whichever it takes to reapproximate and cover that defect. And, and uh, I, I didn't put in pictures for a Nissen or a toupee, but we can go, that, go back to that another time. But it's as simple as you take away the gastric, a short gastrics, and you take the, esophag the stomach and wrap it around the esophagus to make a Nissen, a 360 degree wrap or a toupee, a 270 degree wrap. This is the last thing I wanted to touch on, is the Belzy Mark IV. So uh, Belzy Mark uh, went through several irritations iterations of this procedure and after his fourth procedure, when he finally defined it, he said this is the perfect way to address uh, a hiatal hernia through the chest is how he named it. So it's, that's why it's called Belzy Mark IV. So usually you do a very low thoracotomy, the sixth or even a seventh intercostal space uh, posterolateral thoracotomy so, so that you end up right on the esophagus and the spine. You identify your spine, your aorta, and then you locate your esophagus. You make sure you visualize the vagus nerve, at least the left vagus nerve, the right vagus nerve is on the other side. And then you try to deliver this. Most of the time, this is already in the chest. Uh, if you, you will have some peritoneum overlying it, so you actually debride the peritoneum and open that hernia sac onto the esophagus. Remove this herniated fundus, and then find the stomach. And once you have the stomach, you, do, you may have to remove the overlying esophageal fat pad to identify the GE junction. And you will have to divide uh, some of the proximal short gastrics, four to six short gastrics, and then you do your fundoplication. And contrary to other fundoplication, this is actually a 240 degree fundoplication. So you first place some stitches on the crora and you uh, interrupt these and you lay them aside. You don't want to close this defect just yet. So you, you just put them on snaps and put them aside. And then you actually reduce, you bring your gastric fundus up and with a bougie dilator in place, because you don't want to narrow the lumen of the esophagus too much, you uh, start placing some sutures. So the first set of, set of stitches go through the gastric fundus, goes up to the esophagus and comes back with a full length, um, a full thickness, bites, and you place three of these sutures. And then once you place these sutures, so this is what it looks like on a cross section. You can see one, two, and three. The stomach has been pulled up and you've created this 240 degree wrap. Then you do a second set of sutures. And this is what a second set of sutures employs is now you take stitches through the diaphragm. And this is a Belzy spoon, although this is not the true Belzy spoon. There is a, 
uh, Belzy spoon, which allows you to take nice stitches of this diaphragm that are full thickness, so without uh, hitting something else on the other side. And then once you take that stitch, you go again through the gastric fundus, up through the um, esophagus and come back through. And then once you tie those down, you get this second row of plication sutures. And this is what it looks like on a uh, cross-section view again. <clears throat> so this is your first set of sutures. And the second set is going to the diaphragm and the stomach and the esophagus. So it nicely involutes your esophagus and brings it down. And then you can close your posterior crora by reapproximating it and closing it in place. And that's pretty much it. I didn't get a chance to put it in a summary slide. Um, sorry, I got, got caught off guard, but um, that's pretty much all I had to tell you guys about the um, anti-reflux procedures for parasophageal hernias. Oh. Fantastic, uh, Dr. Pucha, that was just amazing. Uh, there's so much to learn about this organ. It's, it's a very complex organ and uh, not too many of us work with it uh, frequently enough to have such a good understanding of the, of the subject. So thank you very much for uh, giving us this talk and I'm sorry about the timing. We, we probably got it wrong oh, at our end. I, I really should have uh, made sure that I got the message across a bit more clearly. So uh, before I, no I, I, I continue with the talk, uh, we, we try and do, uh, before I continue, I'd, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Is that okay? Are you okay for time, Dr. Oh yeah, I, do. I'm, I have nothing planned for the day. Okay, that's fantastic. So let, let's uh, get back to, uh, to your uh, topic and uh, let's, let's talk about the, the perforations that you spoke about. Uh, I mean, excellent, excellent uh, presentation of uh, how to deal with perforation. So when you, when you stamp the perforation in an esophagus, uh, in, in, a, in a esophageal tear, uh, how do you decide what is the type of stamp you want to use? Uh, you know, is there is there any particular criteria which helps you to decide should I use covered, uncovered, should I use so nitrolol? Uncovered, sure. So you never want to use an uncovered stent on a patient yes. with a perforation because the uncovered will just contaminate your media stinum. So that part where you're going to cover it should always be uh, with a covered stent. Now, if you use a partially covered stent, the ends are not covered to allow granulation tissue to happen. So as long as you entire the entire length of the perforation site is covered with the covered portion of the stent, you're fine. And what we typically do is in the operating room, under fluoroscopy, you visualize where your perforation site is. You see where the contrast exacerbates. You take a paper mm -hmm. clip and you take a paper clip and put it on the patient's chest. And then you know, okay, this is my perforation site. I can see it on fluoro. You ask the fluoroscopic technician to please put this image on one side of the on the computer so I can mm -hmm. keep that visual aid. And when you deploy the stents, the, as you're deploying the stents, there are some radio opaque markers that as you deploy the stent, you can make sure your scent is centered on your paper clip. And then you know 100% that you've covered it. And at the end of the case, you can shoot an on-table esophagram to make sure that no contrast exacerbates to the site of the perforation. Just make sure your endoscope is withdrawn and above the stent as you're injecting the contrast. So what is the recommended stent? What, what is the one that you use? So I use Boston Scientific stents, but they come in, you know, different companies make different types of stents. And um, the reason why I like Boston Scientific is that they have a, a flexibility and they have a, an appropriate radial force that over a period of time, that the extent will expand and then um, adjust to the diameter of the esophagus. But usually the diameter is about two centimeters in size, a normal uh, esophagus. Um, so we, t the one that I tend to use is at uh, 23 millimeters wide. Uh -huh. And, and uh, does it matter if it's a male or a female patient? Is the size different or? No. No, usually, no, it doesn't make any difference because it has a good radial force. It won't go the higher force because you don't want it to perforate through the wall. Have, have you dealt with perforation in children? Do they have I, have, I personally have not uh, because pediatrics in U.S. is handled by a different facility. Yeah, yeah but, but, but uh, sorry. In, in, your, in your reading, have you come across uh, sufficient perforation in children? Is the philosophy pretty much the same? 
I don't know the answer to that question. I, I mean, I would be making it up, but um, okay. right. I'm sure so it happened for different reasons. So, so, so explain to us for the, for the audience, wh why do stents migrate? I mean, if you've gone in there and you put in a stitch or you put in a clip and things like that, why do stents migrate? Mainly because of peristalsis. Because the esophagus, a normal human, the esophagus will still work. And as they pass bolus foods down, it'll peristalsis, so the stents tend to migrate into the stomach. And then you've got two problems. One, it's a stent that's in the stomach. You have to retrieve and pull it out somehow. And then the, you've got gross contamination of your mean, mediastinum that's ongoing. Have you had a stent lost in the gut? Does it go beyond the stomach? I, or? I have not, but I've had a patient transferred out to me where the stent was in the patient's small bowel. I don't know how it made through the pylorus, but it was actually through the small bowel, sitting in the, the small bowel itself. And then one of the general surgeons had to go do an enterotomy, a laparotomy, enterotomy, and remove that stent just so that it doesn't cause any dis, distal problems. Okay, and and you spoke something about stent exchange in the in the talk. Uh, so why do you need to exchange stents? Why not one stent for the whole procedure? Well, you don't know how long it'll be before this perforation site le heals. So uh, there are some biodegradable stents out there, just so you know. So biodegradable stents can be used for esophageal stricture. They usually start to degrade in four to six weeks after placement. And the reason why they're good is because then you don't have to remove them. But the bad thing about biodegradable stents in a perforation or an astomotic leak is, say it degrades, but what if your leak site hasn't resolved? then you have recurrent leakage going on. So that's why you need to remove it after a period of time just to see and assess whether the perforation site has resolved. If it has resolved, you can keep the stent out. If it has not, then you have to do something else. And usually most people will place another stent. I, I love your technique of bridling the umbilical tape across the stent. It sounds very uncomfortable for the patient. Is it uncomfortable having something coming out of your two nails and yeah, no, they are. I, I fortunately warned them enough before the procedure so they're not surprised afterwards. I tell them you'll see these two strings hanging out and you'll feel like you're cross-eyed for a few days. But I promise you it will help you from having a complication of migration and things like that. Um, and so the reason why you actually abut some, it's very important if you were to do that to put a gauze. When I first started out my job at Houston, my partner actually had a patient who was being operated by plastic surgery because she didn't use this nasal little small um, gauze to uh, abut against the nair and the patient's umbilical tapes had perforated through the nasal septum. And so right. the patient had had a nasal reconstruction. So it's very important that you're very vigilant about it, that you'll place something there nice and soft so that they don't have any nasal and, septum. Sure. And, and you said you don't pull it out. You, you, you leave it in the esophagus to go down the natural so you, way. Yeah, you cut those strings, obviously, because if you were to pull those strings out, because they are tied to the other distal end of the stent, as you're trying to pull it out, you may dislodge that stent and cause more issues and aggravation. So what you do is when you cut the strings, the patient will swallow it. I had one patient who I got called by the resident that the patient has two funny looking things coming out of the mouth. So I came running to the patient's room. I knew exactly what they were. There was a milk tape that she swallowed and they were now hanging out from the mouth. So I asked her to open really wide and cut them at the back of the throat and they swallow it down and they just hang in the esophageal newman. They don't feel and, it. And, the, it. And, and then they come out with the stent when you take it out. Is that correct? Right. Yeah because they're anchored, they're like tied to the stent itself with a knot. So when you remove the stent, those two strings also come out. Okay, and, and you, you spoke about endovac therapy, excellent technique, I, I, I love that paper actually. So the replacement of these wax are done under local anesthesia or general anesthesia? No, usually it's general anesthesia, it's too much to tolerate because you have to pass an NG tube through the nares, bring it out through the mouth, tie it to the sponge, and then take the endoscope through the mouth again and drive it down into the esophagus and deploy it in place. It's too much, uh, very uncomfortable. I see. 
And technically, it sounds pretty challenging. I mean, it, 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 it sounds pretty I've actually, simple. I've only tried helping us another surgeon do it because uh -huh. he was struggling. And that was N, that N of one case was enough for me to say, I never want to do this myself. <laughs> But 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 as a, as a technique, it sounds like a good idea to to heal esophageal uh, perforations, isn't it? Because these are these are really difficult situations that you have. Um, we, when you spoke about surgery for esophageal perforation, you said uh, in your talk that you would prefer to go on the left side because you see it better. I mean, for for us normal human beings, we think that the right side is. The esophagus is easier to trace all the way from the top to the bottom. Why do you, as an esophageal surgeon, prefer to go in the left side? Actually, the very lower portion of the esophagus, which, uh, which is in, um, which typically where the perforations are encountered, uh, okay. is much easier to see behind the heart. If you go through the right chest, yes, you can ex extremely dissect it from the top to the bottom. Uh, and it's not hard. You know, classic learning technique was also if you were trying to reach the very top of the esophagus, it's always left, right, left. That's the way we were taught. Uh, go, go for the cervical neck in the left chest, then right, and then the left because the heart, the aortic arch comes in the middle. Uh, but the left is is decently accessible. And I, I've operated up through the left even when the patients, you know, didn't have a frank perforation. It's not as bad as we think. I used to think when I just like what you're saying. I would think I could approach this from the right. And you're probably right. You probably could if you were to pull up the esophagus. But the left wasn't bad. And I have, I've never regretted going through the left chest. So which side do you get perforations more common? Left. Usually more in the left. Mm -hmm. And, they, and, they and, and us, usually the perforations are lower down. Is that correct? For the most part, usually they, you know, some patients have this distal esophageal stricture that was being dilated. Uh, or they had a prior pathology. I, I've had a patient with achalasia who's perforated because of food impaction, uh, and they perforated on the left as well. So it's different reasons, but for the most part, because it's a lower esophageal sphincter, that's where they feel the pressure. And I guess the esophagus lays slightly more to the left than the right. So whenever they perforate, they end up going into the left chest. Uh, the other thing is you showed us a very nice surgical technique. Uh, you know, the textbooks give us such a beautiful picture of putting the mucosa back and putting the muscle back together. Uh, but when you go in there, that's not the picture. It, it's a complete mess. No, it's it? not. I mean, and actually, uh, at, at a couple... Sorry. Yeah, go. No, and actually, a couple of times, I've gone into a patient's chest thinking I'll do a surgical repair. And I'm unable to because whatever stitches I've placed yeah. are not taking. And they just tend to rip this mucosa and make a bigger hole. So what I did on a, 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 at least one patient who I ended up dying in the end, he was 89 or 88. Um, what I did was I simultaneously deployed a stent while the patient was in the lateral decubitus position. And as I was seeing it, I took a muscle flap and flapped over the defect thinking that hopefully he can plaster this down and it will work. Um, he for, uh, unfortunately had other complications and became anuric and had to go on dialysis. Uh, so his wife withdrew care and he was made comfort measures and, and passed away. But I wondered if he was ever going to make it out of the hospital and try and eat and swallow again, like a normal person. And if I would have done an esophagectomy and that would have served him better, but you know, 89 year old, I didn't want to do an esophagectomy on him. Sure. And, and, and the guys in which you did uh, the, uh, you know, the, the stoma on the chest wall, uh, what percentage of patients would you do something like this? And then how do you uh, repair it afterwards? So I do a lot. <laughs> and then unfortunately, believe it or not, most patients don't come back for reconstruction because they're usually so bad when they, they get so deconditioned from the insult. Uh, that I only have a few patients who ever make it out of post-op complications or go to rehab and recover. Uh, I've done maybe a handful. I can only think of a dozen patients who've ever come back for reconstructions. And, and I, uh, we tend to do a lot of esophageal diversions only because of the gross contamination or esophageal cancer um, that's gone stage four. Um, so, so, I so they live out... So they live out the rest of their lives with the diversion? Mm -hmm. 
I have three a, patients out there who are lingering like that. I don't know if they'll ever come back to surgery. Uh, one patient happens to be Indian, an Indian cardiologist who had a spontaneous perforation and was repaired elsewhere and then came to me as a transfer. Um, because of other reasons, he didn't like one of my partner's care, so he asked me to take over and then didn't like uh, my care, so he got transferred to John Hopkins, which is another neighboring institution. And I, uh, I heard from his niece that he's not doing well and they're making him comfort measures recently. But that's, the, that's unfortunately what happens is that, you know, he had an underlying cardiac issue being a cardiologist, go figure. Um, and then once he became so sick, one insult happened with another, too many arrhythmias, you know, and then obviously you question, will this person ever make it to reconstruction after I've diverted him? Um, and and uh, you know, they, the second operation is much more significant, either jejunar interposition or a colon interposition. You obviously have to make sure you have enough vasculature. Uh, there's a procedure, we can have a whole talk on this another time, of supercharging the conduits because these conduits sometimes are not very well vascularized, you bring them up in the neck and then you supercharge them with another uh, vessel from uh, Lima, left internal mammary artery. So you, the supercharge of it, uh, and you, you take away the patient's head of the clavicle, the, man, the head of the manubrium, and the first and the second rib to do this reconstruction. So it's a, a good 10 to 12 hour operation. And to be able to withstand such a big, big operation, the patient has to be pretty robust and it's it's very few and far between that we get patients who perforated who are 40 or 50 year old they're the ones who will make it usually the 70 80 year olds will not ever come back to surgery because of some hiccup or another how, how good are these so the endoscopic clips for repair of prostate? i don't i don't find them very useful and usually those are done by GI docs. If they find a perforation at the time of their endoscopy, if they're scoping somebody and they dilate and they perforate, they'll place the endoscopic clips. By the time they use the thoracic surgeon's lap, that esophagus mucosa is so de debrided and denuded that you're not able to find good healthy mucosa to put those clips together. So what would you say is the overall success rate in treating esophageal perforations? You can get them through the operation. I would say there's a good 95% chance the patient will make it through the operation and they'll survive the uh, initial insult. The question is, what's their long-term prognosis? Will they have good quality of life after an insult? Will they ever, especially if you diverted them, will they ever come back for reconstruction? And that I would say is a good question to research and see how many out there do make it. Um, unfortunately, I'm sure, maybe some of the databases will have that. Um, but I would say only about 50 to 60 percent patients make it back for reconstruction. Okay. Uh, okay, so coming to the next topic, the hernias, uh, which you spoke about. Uh, in an exam, if, if there is a case of a hiatus hernia, how will the candidate uh, convince the examiner what is the operation that needs to be done in terms of missing stupids or a loose missing? So just give them a few guidelines on how yeah. to talk in an exam with a hernia. So after, you know, after doing an appropriate HNP, that's uh, history and physical, you would ask, uh, you would get some studies. And usually the studies start off with an esophagram and endoscopy, like I said. And based on your endoscopic findings, you can decide whether you need to complement your uh, workup with a, uh, with a BH Bravo study. If you don't need a BH Bravo study, you can skip that. And then you can go in and say you want a manometry. Now, depending on who's your examiner, they may give you a hard time. Like, why are you going to do a manometry? Do you do a manometry on everybody? Is a manometry reliable in a patient with a large parasophageal hernia where you know the GE junction is sitting in the media startup? Are you going to be, are you really going to make the patient have a two nissen? Now, there is a big uh, literature um, out there that says that a two patient undergoing a two pay has equivalent results of a Nissen. So if you get the feeling that your examiner across the table really is not wanting you to do a manometry, you can say that there is no evidence to back, that back up that I need to do a manometry on everyone. However, early in my practice, I would prefer doing a manometry on every patient. 
but as you as we all mature into a big, you know esophageal surgeons and get more comfortable as to who, which patient is better for Nissen versus Toupe, you can make that argument. Now, if you have a 25 year old patient who, da who does have reflux and you're working them up, I would be a little bit more aggressive about saying, no, I definitely want a manometry. This guy is very young. I want to make sure that has, he has, he, I do a Nissen on him, but a Nissen that's warranted because he has a long life because we know a Nissen is more protective for anti-reflux than a Toupe since it is completely encompassing. And I don't want this patient to be dependent on PPIs for the rest of his life. So if you can justify that, yeah, it's reasonable, then you can say, okay, I'll do a manometry. And then obviously, like I said, a gastric emptying study to help you uh, make sure that the patient doesn't have gastroparesis. Okay. And, and, and the choice of Nissen versus Toupe? So same, you know, if your manometry is normal and you can say it's, uh, as long as majority of the boluses are normal, I'll say um, Nissen is a better operation than a Toupe, although I don't have much literature to back that up. If you say that, you're being a vigilant doctor. Uh, the, the examiner will know that, okay, you're just not pulling things out of your head just because you want to do a Nissen. But if you say there's not good literature, but I have, um, I have my own anecdotal experience that says that Nissen's patients will do better because this gentleman is young and I want to protect him from having long-standing complexes, complex uh, complications. I'll do a Nissen fundoglycation, uh, or then, or you can justify that this patient has a very large parasophageal hernia, the GE junction sits above in the chest, most likely has a dysfunctional esophagus, so I'll be better off doing a toupee. And as we all know from the literature, a 270 wrap is, has equivalent outcomes to a 360 wrap. I think the patient overall will have adequate outcomes. Okay. Now, when you're repairing hernias uh, and, and you're going endoscopically, uh, how do you decide whether you want to go abdominally or chest? So if you're doing an endoscopic repair, there are my, 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 a bunch of operative you know, um, transoral fundoplication and TIF techniques. There's also something called the LINX repair. And I didn't touch on that. LINX stands for L-I-N-X. So uh, LINX repair is basically a, a magnetic strip of beads that you put around the hiatus to tighten it. And that, that's done abdominally. That patient cannot have a hernia, that's key. The patient can have a reflux, can have a sliding type one hernia, but should not really have a hernia. The reason is in those patients, you're not going to operate and dissect around the esophagus and the hiatus. You're not gonna free it up. All you do is you make a small window so you can take your string of beads around it and tighten it and approximate it just tight enough to snug enough to make the reflux go away. And those beads will stay in place and as the patient swallows, those magnetic beads can expand and let them relax so that the bolus goes down and you don't get reflux otherwise. They have other complications. I don't do them personally, and maybe that's why I didn't put them in the talk, but it's worth knowing. And for if you're ever in a board examiner, exam situation, it's important that you tell them you're aware of this technique and it exists out there, but you should always preface it by saying, I've never done one before, but what I've read in the books. And that will protect you because then they'll say, okay, this is a good sound decision surgeon. Who knows what they're talking about? And who will say that I've never done one? So you don't, don't pull things out that you've never seen before. If you've seen it before, say I've seen a case like this before and this is what I recall, uh, but I've never done one. And my typical approach is X, Y, and Z. So, so again, coming back to my question, how do you choose between an abdominal approach versus a thoracic approach? So a thoracic approach, a Belzy repair, is that what you're suggesting? A Belzy repair, because of its thoracotomy, is a little slightly more morbid than a laparoscopic approach with small incision. Now say if you have a patient who's had multiple abdominal surgeries and he's a truly abdominal nightmare, you don't want to go through their abdomen. A patient has had a large hiatal hernia repair with a compartment um, release, um, and has a large piece of mesh, you don't want to go through the abdomen. You can make an argument, I'll go through the chest. Say a patient has had, I say, if you've had a redo parasophageal hernia, you can operate on it once, you can operate on it twice, you can maybe try it a third time, but after that, go through the abdomen, go through the chest. 
because the recurrent parasophagy hernias will be extremely hard coming back in the same plane. You won't find a safe plane to go through. You will make some hydrogenic injuries during a dissection into the stomach or the esophagus. So best bet is to go to the chest. So usually those are, those are situations where we've left the LZ repair too. So what is the risk of recurrence in, in hiatus? In any parasophagy hernia, we quote patients that you have a good uh, 15 to 20% chance of a recurrence, but only a 10 to 15% chance of symptomatic recurrence, warranting another second repair over a lifetime. So if you live 10 years, you have a 10 to 15% chance that you may need another operation for this. Obviously, the younger the patients, the more pregnant, the multi-parous women, the higher obesity uh, will have a higher risk of recurrence. The one thing I didn't touch on, a patient who comes to you with a large parasophagia hernia who has a BMI over 30, and especially other comorbidities, think of a bariatric procedure before going straight to the operating room. It is important to pick that up on your board exams too. Ask the examiner, is the patient obese? What's their BMI? Uh, because if you have a BMI greater than 35, you can go straight to bariatric. BMI greater than 30 with other comorbidities, you can qualify for a bariatric procedure than you doing an anti-reflux. So can you do a bariatric procedure at the same time to a hernia repair? No, usually what they'll do is they'll consider, the bariatric surgeon will uh, consider doing either a ruin y gastric bypass or a gastric sleeve. And at the time of that operation, they'll bring it down. Now, if you do a gastric sleeve, as you would imagine, you would go along the greater curvature of the stomach and staple the stomach off. Uh, so you won't have a fundus to do a plication anymore. What they'll do is they'll anchor that stomach in the abdomen and close the diaphragmatic defect at the same time. So when you do repairs of the hernias with uh, the various procedures, uh, is it mandatory to do a gastric procedure in every case? Gastric outlet procedure? No, no, no. It, only if you have issues with gastric pylor. Like if you, if you actually do it on every patient, you'll have a difficult time managing their bile reflux symptoms. So you only do it if they have gastroparesis, if you've documented that. Okay, so, so but, but you decide that preoperatively before you go in. That you can decide that preoperatively. Say, say you have a patient who comes in and who's been telling you that I'm not doing well after your surgery, doc. You know, it's been two months, it's been three months, I have this gastric bloating, it's early satiety. And you say, okay, fine, let's just do another gastric emptying study because you have reasons to believe that you may have bad their vagus nerves. If you had a prior gastric emptying study you could compare to, great. If you don't, regardless, as long as this gastric emptying study tells you that you have gastric outlet obstruction or delayed emptying, that after four hours that 90% of the food they swallowed is still in the stomach, you're obligated to do a gastric uh, pyloric drainage procedure. And then you counsel them appropriately. You just tell them either you bag the nerves uh, or uh, the nerves were never functioning from the very index operation because we didn't have a prior gastric emptying study. Uh, whatever the case may be, we need to take care of the situation at hand. Well, while we've got you on the forum, can we ask you a little bit about corrosive strictures? Or is it a whole talk by itself? It, it can be, but depends on the question. I mean, I'm not an expert, but we deal with a corrosive esophagitis a patient every now and then. Is there, is there a published algorithm for management of corrosive strictures for your students to look up? I am sure there would be. I would have to do a little bit more literature search on that. Uh, but for the most part, we deal with it by doing first dilations. And of, oftentimes you have to complement these patients with the feeding tube. Um, I've managed those patients mainly in pediatric surgery, actually, during our rotations in pediatrics, uh, because uh, little kids will swallow anything that they find looks blue and tasty in, the, uh, in your cabinets. So uh, those patients will get dilated with an, um, routine dilations every few weeks. Uh, you can even try managing them with stents if they're adults. Uh, <coughs> Complement them with a feeding tube so they can recover and heal. Uh, obviously, counsel them that they most they can have a perforation during the time of their dilation. So, mentally be ready that you may need a stent or even an esophagectomy if this doesn't work. But for the most part, surprisingly, 
they actually do well without ever needing an esophagectomy. We have a, in my current hospital, we have a huge burn center. So our burn patients will have some caustic injury patients uh, that come up to them. And so then we get consulted and we manage them with them, but we've never done an esophage uh, esophagectomy on them. We've only dilated them and bridged them through their acute insult. And for the most part, they do pretty well. So who does the esophagectomy for them? If they need an esophagectomy, they'll come to us. But if they don't need it, the, the GI docs will dilate it without asking us to be involved. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask you a question from the audience. Uh, I'm going to read it out to you. So in GERD, if it is found to be severe type 3 GE tumor, if total gastrectomy was planned after resecting adequate margins of the esophagus and gastrectomy, where would the rua wide gastrojejunostomy so, be done no, so, either in the thorax or abdomen. I, I'm trying to figure out the question. No, so I, I get it. What they're asking is that there, there's in the esophageal cancer, which can be another talk, we can talk about that. There are, the Stewart classification actually tells you where's the epicenter of the tumor. Meaning is the tumor located, where's the center point of that tumor? Is it at the GE junction, which is Stewart type two? If it's, I believe four or five centimeters above the GE junction, it says it's a Stewart type one. If it's five centimeters below the G junction, it's sewer type three. So there's a constant battle between the surgical oncologists and the thoracic surgeons that say sewer type three belongs to me, no, it belongs to me. Uh, because you know both surgeons want to operate on a gastric fundus cancer. So unfortunately, some patients, depending on who, whose hands they land up in, will get treated with like an esophageal cancer and others will treat it like a gastric cancer. And so their pre-op neoadjuvant chemotherapy is also planned accordingly. And after a resection, uh, you need to make sure you have negative margin. So if it's a very high gastric tumor, sewer type three is a high gastric tumor, you can never do an esophageal gastrojejunostomy. I'm sorry, you cannot do a ruin y esophagus gastrojejunostomy, right? Because your stomach is completely taken away. You're hanging on with the esophagus that's coming from above and your stomach from below. If you divide it at the length of the esophagus, you all you have is a choice in the esophageal jejunostomy, not a gastrojejunostomy. So there's a terminology different. So it's a esophageal jejunostomy. Usually you'll make that right at the level of the diaphragm because you can't really go up in the chest. So what we would do is we would put some stitches on the esophagus, and that's the thoracic surgeon will often get involved with these. You put some stitches in the esophagus and you anchor it and pull it down to your diaphragm so that it doesn't retract back up as you're dividing your stomach and sending it off for margin assessment. And then you try to bring in a loop of the jejunum and connect it. Uh, you can do a, either a Roux and Y or a loop esophageal jejunostomy. Most people like Roux and Y. So you, bring a loop of the jejunum and you make the anastomosis. Because the caliber of the esophagus and jejunum almost match up nicely, they, those yeah. patients actually do pretty well and they heal nicely. Of course. Uh, and Dr. Khalil is asking, when do we choose to do a Belzi Mark V? <laughs> is there a Belzi Mark V? I don't know the answer. I, I don't know. I, he's asking me. I'm assuming he knows what he's talking about. Uh, so anyway, it's, I think it's, it's a Belzee Mark IV. Okay, we let that one be. Uh, so we, we decide is that same thing. Abdominal catastrophe patient, multiple prior abdominal procedures. You don't want to go through the abdomen, recurrent, recurrent hernia, um, or you know, a patient just doesn't, uh, is not doing well from the her abdominal hernia repairs. Okay. All right. I, I'm not clear about what Roy is writing in the next one. So, okay, we'll, we'll let that be. Uh, I think uh, if there are any more questions, anybody's got any hot topics they want to ask, uh, please feel free to come online. Uh, switch on your microphone and ask the question. I just to look in the other groups to see if anybody's got any questions to be asked. Just a second, uh, Pooja. Because I've got four or five groups logging in. So at the moment, the other groups are quite okay. All right. Okay, thank you very much, Pooja. It's been a very uh, interesting talk. Uh, I really learned a lot today, I have to say. And uh, it's amazing the amount of work that you do in the esophagus. It's, I've always thought it's a very unforgiving organ, for sure. It is. <laughs> I have to spend I a lifetime doing it. it. Sorry? 
I unfortunately love esophagus. I'm, I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do. <laughs> okay, so that that's great, uh, and and we really appreciate uh, you coming online with us and sharing your uh, knowledge. Uh, the students uh, have learned a lot, and I'm sure they will be able to do their board exams a bit better. Uh, after having heard this uh, talk. I think we should ask the audience, uh, especially the students and residents, if it would benefit them. I, the one thing that I didn't cover in my talk on uh, benign pathology is achalasia. And that, that can be a le lecture on its own, as well as esophageal cancer. If they think that's going to make a difference in their board exams. I'd, I'd yeah, yeah. They'll be very happy if you can give us the time. They'll be very happy to have you on on on. on on this group. We, we are very keen to learn about these topics. Uh, we would also like you to cover GERD, so you know the reflux disease in yeah. detail uh, in, right. in terms of you know the various classifications and the management and you know the... Right and, and actually that's so, very important. The, uh, the interpretation of manometries is key so yeah we can work on that at a different okay. level. So, so, so you, you, you tell us, you, you interact with me and let me know when you can give us time and, and we'd be really grateful if you could do that. As, as you know, you are, you are live not just on this group, uh, you're also live on the IAX website uh, and, yeah. and a lot of uh, surgeons across the country are, are listening on and you're also live on about three or four other channels uh, in various countries. So a lot no, of you... people are listening to you and they're looking forward to uh, your next topic. So we'll be very, very happy if you could uh, do more lectures for us. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you very All much, Pooja, and, and thanks.